afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Michelle Ashton. I'm the Director of Communications for the Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida. And on behalf of the entire board and staff, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to join us for a conversation about Florida's unique springs. Before we get going, I want to cover a couple quick housekeeping items. Can you please double check and make sure that you are muted and you remain muted throughout the duration of our conversation today? The exception is during the Q&A portion at the end, at which time you can use the raise your hand feature and I'll ask you to unmute and you can speak directly to the presenters. Or if you prefer, you can drop your question in the chat and I can ask it for you. Um, that feature is particularly helpful if you have a question pop up during a presentation you wanna make sure you don't forget. Also in the chat, you'll find a link to a survey. We'd love your feedback about um, today's conversation, what you think we could improve and topics for um, that you'd like to see us cover in the future. So speaking of presentations, I'm really excited to introduce our two speakers today, joined by Dr. Ben Tanner. He's the Associate Professor and Chair of Environmental Sciences and Studies at Stetson University. And Dr. Bob Knight, he's the Executive Director of the Howard T. Odom Florida Springs Institute. Um, both Ben and Bob are gonna share about projects that were funded in part by our Protect Florida Springs plate. It's a blue plate with the image of a scuba diver on it. Um, in this last round of funding, we gave out 14 grants, um, totaling just over $270,000 for Florida Springs. And since um, the plate's inception in 2009, we've given out 133 grants for um, just shy of $1.9 million. And um, I think both Ben and Bob's projects are gonna reflect a, the dual purpose of, um, of our plate, which is to both raise awareness of and advance science of um, Florida Springs. So Ben, do you wanna get us started? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, thanks so much for having me here. And, and uh, certainly thanks to you, um, Michelle, for arranging this. Let me see if I can uh, share my screen here. Go. And go to slideshow. One more button to push and I'll be ready to go. All right. Uh, uh, can, can everybody see my screen now? Okay, great. So uh, I would also like to say uh, that it's a pleasure to share this, I, I guess, virtual stage uh, with Dr. Knight, uh, given his many contributions uh, to spring work in Florida. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues and, and I guess co-conspirators, uh, Jason Evans and Kirsten Work, who got me into Springs Research when I landed in Florida uh, back in 2016, and uh, who have also been part of the study uh, that I'm going to present today since, since it began. Uh, so um, I'd like to begin by thinking about how the world uh, looked not too long ago, really, geologically speaking, roughly 15,000 years ago. Uh, during uh, the end of what's popularly called the last ice age. So, of course, with so much uh, water uh, bound up as glaciers, uh, global sea levels at that time were uh, much, much lower. So uh, this graph shows what happened with sea level as all of that ice melted. That's over a football field in length or a height, I guess, of sea level rise, uh, about 120 meters specifically, over a roughly 10,000 year period uh, before sea levels stabilized uh, about 6,000 years ago, right around here. Uh, and of course, they're beginning to rise rapidly again uh, for a different reason now, but uh, we're, we're kind of not looking at a time frame here that, that would show kind of more modern sea level rise like we've, we've been seeing over the last uh, decades. But th this kind of sets the stage for this longer term sea level rise. So uh, as sea level rose, this had the effect of shrinking Florida drastically uh, as sea levels rose, uh, gently sloping continental shelf of Florida um, means that kind of a lot of land uh, was displaced, especially uh, out in the Gulf Coast. So this map shows what Florida would have looked like about 18,000 years ago. Uh, we actually have evidence of archaeological sites uh, out in the Gulf of Mexico, 
uh, here uh, that were flooded by this sea level rise. And some of this evidence actually shows that people were living in association with our paleo spring systems. So uh, a classic idea has been that many uh, Florida springs uh, began to, or would have begun to flow just before sea levels began to stabilize about 6,000 years ago. Uh, kind of right in here, and, and as water tables that, that drive that groundwater flow from the Florida aquifer began to approach their uh, present position. So uh, we know that uh, Florida springs are uh, wonderfully abundant. And uh, that they also unfortunately face a number of threats, uh, including negative him, uh, human impacts to water, uh, water quantity, um, also water quality, and uh, also to the species that are present within the spring systems. So kind of the work I do, uh, my angle on this is that some of these problems can be put into context by studying how our spring systems evolved in ancient times, and my research specialization has involved uh, using ancient wetland uh, deposits like a mud and peat uh, to study environmental changes through time. So it was natural when I moved to Florida to adapt this line of work to springs, which I have to admit are, are really uh, much nicer to work in than say a peat bog or a salt marsh or a mangrove system where you get mud all over you during field work and there's, there's no way to get it off of you in, until you get back, uh, back to your house. So uh, I conducted initial work using a Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida Protect Florida Springs grant in collaboration with my Stetson colleagues, uh, Kirsten Work and uh, Jason Evans that was designed to explore 15 different Florida spring runs to measure how much sediment was preserved in the runs and also the age of that sediment in order to determine if a paleo environmental history could be constructed for some of our spring systems. So uh, we did this by probing along the spring runs and analyzing uh, sediments that we found using a variety of different parameters and uh, by radiocarbon dating some of the deepest sediments uh, that we found uh, from each of the spring systems that we study, just to get an idea of the ages of some of these systems that, that we were working on and uh, dealing with. So uh, we visited a number of springs along the St. John's Swanee, uh, so the St. John's River system, uh, the Swanee River system, and also the Santa Fe uh, River system. Um, and so uh, about 15 different springs in total. And what we found, uh, so these are the different springs we visited over here. And actually these are the radiocarbon ages that we determined for the kind of the deepest sediments that we found in each of the spring runs. And so these are thousands of years for most of the springs. So we found that many of these springs pre preserve paleo environmental records spanning thousands of years, that's the highlighted column, uh, and that some of the spring runs had deposits that were actually much older um, than might be expected given the lower sea levels and water tables before 6,000 years ago. So uh, for example, uh, Wakaiwa Spring, we, we had uh, really old radiocarbon dates from the spring run just downstream of the head spring. So uh, we were fortunate to be able to publish this work in a fairly recent paper in the journal uh, Southeastern Geographer, which you could go uh, get your hands on if you want to learn about all the details of, of that study. Uh, I have to say, though, that that was a pretty uh, coarse resolution study for the kind of work uh, we do, just basically trying to get out there and take a look at a lot of different springs and kind of probe them and see what's there and, and see how old the deposits were to just to get at a range of ages and, and figure out we, what we were dealing with so that we could do a more detailed work. So uh, the next set of questions that we had really involved a more detailed paleo environmental history at individual springs and what that history could tell us. And so that was the focus of our most recent Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida Protect Florida Springs grant. 
So uh, what I would like to do is to focus on one of those sites that we visited, which we developed uh, one of the most comprehensive records for uh, a spring that may have been flowing during the last ice age and which is located not too far down the road from Stetson's campus. So uh, this is Wakaiwa Spring. And of course, given its proximity to Orlando, uh, this is a popular spring that enjoys heavy traffic and use, especially from people trying to escape the heat in the summertime. So this is uh, the head spring here and the pool. And of course, you can see all the people uh, that are swimming in it. And uh, actually their activity might uh, uh, kind of have an explanation for something that we'll see in a, a graph uh, kind of a little bit later on in, in my pr presentation here. So, so this is where we are, are on the map uh, of Florida right here. So this is Wakaiwa Spring. So uh, we took uh, sediment cores in the spring run. Uh, in this case, it's the headwaters of the Wakaiva River in a number of places to work up detailed cores with multiple types of what we call environmental proxy records. So I'll get into what that means in, in just a minute here. And what I'd like to do is actually uh, show a short clip from this video uh, where we were demonstrating a couple of different coring techniques for another presentation uh, I did. So I've got to hit the right spot in this video. I think it's going to be right around here. So, uh, so this is a video that demonstrates one of the ways we core along spring runs. In this case, uh, it's with what's called a piston core. And Casey Ramey, who's actually a current student here at Stetson that works with us, uh, was a student who was kind enough actually to help shoot this video during the height of the COVID precautions, uh, along with uh, Cole Orsini, another student who's now graduated. I don't think he quite appears all the way in the segment of video here, but, but you can kind of see his feet over there. But we're able to collect long cores of up to several meters, uh, which we can extract. You'll see uh, Casey extracting the core here and then analyze in a number of different ways. Because this was just a demonstration, we just kind of put the mud right out uh, on top of the grass near our aquatic center. But of course, when we're gonna do analysis of the sediment, we have to be much more careful. We extract the cores in, in the lab and uh, of course in a, in a much kind of cleaner environment so as not to contaminate the sediments that, that we're dealing with. So this is actually an example of a three meter long core. So, uh, so each one of these is just over a little over a yard in length uh, that we pulled from just downstream from Wakaiwa, uh, Wakaiwa Spring and it shows the thick organic deposits that are really useful uh, for paleo environmental analysis. So the top of the core is over here and it goes deeper and deeper and deeper uh, all the way to the bottom. That's as far as we could get. We call that refusal when we hit those bottom sediments. And uh, so this was a deep core that turned out to be thousands of years old. So these cores, uh, this is actually a different core and it's from a different project, but it shows uh, the kind of sampling we do. We subsample the cores back in the lab at whatever interval or resolution we're interested in learning about. And then we uh, process the sediments and they go uh, undergo all kinds of different processing techniques uh, in the lab, uh, depending on what we want to learn about the mud. And uh, as you can see, we, we treat our mud uh, very well in the labs that I work in uh, here at Stetson. So uh, that analysis can uh, actually be uh, quite sophisticated. And uh, I, I would add to that uh, expensive in this case uh, from obtaining radiocarbon dates using a particle accelerator. So this is an accelerator mass spectrometer in this case at Penn State, but we don't use that one. We send our samples to actually South Florida uh, for uh, international chemical analysis. They have an accelerator mass spectrometer as well, but, but they didn't publish pictures of it online. But this is what one looks like. Uh, to analysis uh, using an elemental analyzer. This is actually the instrument I use for my PhD, but I still send samples to the University of Tennessee 
And uh, we can actually learn about levels of carbon and nitrogen in our cores. I can get to why that's important in just a minute. And sometimes we actually do uh, very simple types of analysis, like in this case, uh, simply uh, wet sieving sediments through a screen uh, to learn about what sizes and kinds of mineral sediments are present in our samples. So all kinds of different analysis and those analyses can tell us all kinds of different things about our sediment cores. And in this case, about the history of the springs that we're looking at. So for example, these types of measurements can tell us quite a bit about uh, how much carbon is in them. For example, you would expect less carbon in samples that had a high mineral sediment or sand load, uh, which you might see if a spring run is being disturbed due to bank erosion or due to foot traffic in the spring run. Uh, carbon nitrogen ratios can tell us how much higher plant versus algal input there might be through time in our spring runs. Uh, that's because algae have proportionally more nitrogen in their uh, plant structures um, than higher plants do, and uh, therefore they have lower carbon to nitrogen ratios. So, of course, right now in a lot of our springs, we're worried about algal abundance uh, as they receive things like elevated nutrient loads. Uh, so these types of measurements can give us an idea of how abundant algae were in the past in different springs. So uh, th that's really what I mean uh, when I say proxy record, uh, when I mentioned that before in the presentation. Uh, as an example, at least as far as we know, no one was measuring mineral sediment loads in springs uh, thousands of years ago, but we're able to analyze these different parameters in order to estimate what those loads would have been like. Uh, thus, the, the paleo record stands in as, as kind of a proxy for actual measurements because those measurements don't exist. So this is actually one of our cores from just downstream of Wakaiwa Spring. And this graph is showing our radiocarbon ages for different samples uh, versus depth down the core on this axis. And you can notice how the sediments get older as you go deeper down, as you would expect. The cool thing about this graph is that it shows that deposition began before 15,000 years ago in the Wakaiva River near that head spring. So the spring is, or spring run has sediments that are really quite old. So uh, I know I'm throwing a lot at you in, in this, but I, I'm going to highlight just a few things, just some of the things, kinds of things we can learn about by analyzing the sediments. We found that some measurements like those CN ratios I was talking about early, earlier or currently at pretty low levels. Uh, that's the sediments up at the top of those cores there. Uh, then for much of the past, so they're falling completely to the left of this vertical line on the graph, these recent sediments, suggesting that we're in a period where there's a slightly elevated algal contribution to the sediments in the spring run. So uh, a really interesting finding, though, from this spring came when looking at the, the mineral sediments, which we're looking at over here. And we see a really high mineral sediment loads near uh, present times after many thousands of years of very low uh, sand or mineral sediment influx that we see down here. So we measure this by uh, uh, sieving sediments and then weighing the deposits. So. Um, what that uh, suggests really is that uh, perhaps recent human impacts around the spring headwaters have resulted in an unusual influx of mineral sediment to the spring run beyond the natural pattern that was in place in this case for thousands of years. So uh, by the way, the large change, it's kind of really cool at the bottom of each one of these graphs, the large changes that you're seeing in the trends down at the bottom of each one of these uh, graphs correspond with the transition from the Pleistocene to the Holocene, essentially the earth coming out of the last ice age. So deep down in the cores, we're looking at a climate and environment uh, that we're seeing would, might not have kind of a good modern uh, analog. So uh, I'm almost done here. I've got just a, a few slides and I, I can wrap this up quickly. Just where we want to move kind of further uh, with this work, we plan to continue it. Uh, and right now we're beginning uh, actually a new project. So just briefly about that, water lettuce is present in many spring runs across the state, and it's all often managed as an invasive plant. Uh, but there's some evidence that at least some of the water lettuce in Florida is native. 
including from uh, Lake Annie, evidence from Lake Annie, where water lettuce seeds were found in a layer that was over 13,000 years old. So one cool thing we, we can do now that we've got spring run sediments that are thousands of years old and the deposits from them is uh, look in those sediments for things like the presence of water lettuce seeds. And if we find them, we'd like to uh, radiocarbon date individual seeds. So that way we can clearly establish the antiquity of the plant in Florida and its presence and potential abundance through time. So this study has potential implications for how water lettuce might be managed uh, across the state. Uh, if we end up finding that it's widespread in Florida over thousands of years, uh, of course, we might find that it's very rare in Florida and uh, the older sediments. And, and that's really the fun and the cool thing about scientific investigation. So I hope that uh, everyone knows a little bit more about the kinds of things we can do with sediments and uh, the wonderful mud that's preserved in spring runs. Uh, we can learn uh, a little more about the deep history of these beautiful springs. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources, uh, site access and the field and lab support of, of many students, but thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. Bob. Are you ready? Can we send it over to you? Uh, certainly. Uh, that was a great presentation, Ben. I really enjoyed it myself. I want, definitely want to get a copy of that report. And maybe, Michelle, you can tell us how we get copies of reports from the foundation. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, interested Absolutely. In yeah, I'm interested in archaeology, too. And uh, I've actually done an excavation next to a spring on the Santa Fe River. And we're finding um, using OSL dating, uh, dates over 20,000 years old in cultural materials. So that's that's of interest, and uh, hopefully that'll be published later this year. Uh, I want to share my screen as well, if I can, if I can figure it out. Okay, I can, I can see it. Can you see it, Michelle? See that screen? Michelle, can you see the screen? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I want to thank the um, Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida. They've been providing funding uh, through the years for the Florida Springs Institute. Um, and, I, and they asked me to talk today about the field school that we did uh, last year. Uh, let me see if the slide will advance. Okay, uh, just more background on myself. I um, have been involved in springs for a long time. I uh, got my doctorate degree from the University of Florida in systems ecology in 1980 after studying Silver Springs for two years with Howard Odin. Uh, I've written a number of books. My latest book is the cover is shown here uh, with a picture of Rock Springs, um, Saving Florida Springs, Prescription for Springs Health. Uh, we're located in High Springs. Um, I'm very envious of the Stetson Aquatic Research Center. It's uh, just an amazing thing. We are much more low budget. Uh, we're uh, totally uh, based on um, donations and not and uh, grants, and that's why we appreciate the tag grant so much. But we're located in High Springs in this uh, historic building, and uh, there's actually some controversy in High Springs now about our mural, which I guess brings a lot of attention to it. So. Um, we are a uh, organization that focuses on spring science uh, and springs education. And uh, we've been offering field schools, uh, springs field schools for years, ever since uh, I think the first one was 2013. And we do those on a variety of uh, formats. Uh, of course, the COVID uh, outbreak in 2020, uh, we had to cancel our field school for that year, uh, but the, um, Tag grant program helped fund a uh, scholarships for a field school last year in 2021. But we still, with the COVID still running wild during that time, we had to come up with a new way of, of uh, completing that without uh, endangering our students. So the purpose of the field schools is to introduce people, just common people, off the street people, as well as students and, and state employees to the water resource issues of Florida. And springs are really a great case history um, for understanding what's going on with Florida water. Um, the problems that springs are facing are 
um, very similar to the problems being faced by water resources from uh, from the Keys to Pensacola and Florida. And we really have an urgent need for citizens that are capable of, of understanding those problems, of evaluating um, water resource management actions, and uh, hopefully to vote for the environment in the future. Um, the way we came, got around the um, um, masking issues and indoor um, uh, issues that we've had in previous field school uh, was to hold our um, communal events, if you will, at Coast Springs uh, County Park, which is on the Santa Fe River, the Alaska County Park, and uh, they graciously allowed us to use that facility. It's a very impressive place. And so our in-person part of the uh, field school was outside uh, in this um, structure, as well as on the, both the Santa Fe River and Springs and the Itchtuckee River and Springs. Uh, and we felt, and, and the attendees were, you know, asked to mask up and, and to come um, to that only if they were comfortable. Uh, the other thing we did to change up on the field school was to record our presentations. And we typically invite a group of uh, experts uh, from uh, related to Springs to speak at these um, field schools. Uh, where in the in early days, I I would generally teach all the different parts of the field school. Uh, since I taught that at the University of Florida, uh, I taught the whole Springs Ecology class there. I, um, uh, with time, I uh, invited my colleagues, who, many of whom had a deeper knowledge of their specific subjects. So we, we recorded presentations by all these individuals and then made those available to our students. So this is just an example of one of those presentations. So it's pre-recorded. Uh, the students were allowed to watch these recordings or were encouraged to throughout the field school. And then uh, I'll show you how we pulled it all together. But so this was uh, Sky Notes Dean with the, he was at the Swanee River Water Management District, talked about Springs plant communities. Uh, Dr. Steve Walsh uh, with the U.S. Geological Survey talked about the faunal communities in Florida Cars. Um, and I talked about ecosystem properties. Um, of our springs. Um, Mike Roth with our Santa Fe River uh, gave the uh, lecture about springs advocacy. That's a very important part of restoration is advocacy. That's not what we do anymore, but the Florida Springs Council and about 50 environmental organizations are strongly advocating for restoring our springs. So we put together a, uh, a schedule that pulled in these presentations as well as field uh, studies. And so just this is the way the schedule looked, uh, we released these videos at various times. In other words, they weren't made available to the public. They were made available to those people that signed up for the field school. And there were 42 people that ultimately signed up for the field school, uh, some online only and others in person. Uh, so we released uh, the course overview, the hydrogeology lecture, and uh, past, present, and future lectures uh, the first day, several days before our field trips. And then we released two more lectures the second day on Wednesday, March 10th, uh, one by Rob Matson with this, the St. John's River Water Management District on water quality and one by myself on human stresses in the springs. And then Sky Notes, Dean's uh, presentation, Steve Walsh's presentation, another one of mine, uh, were released on Thursday. And then Friday, we invited everybody that signed up to come to a sort of a banquet, an outside banquet at Topo Springs. And uh, that day, we also released two more, uh, one by Ryan Smart of the Florida Springs Council and one by Mike Roth of uh, the Santa Fe, our Santa Fe River. Um, and then we had a uh, check-in and introduction that evening, and we had uh, movies, outdoor movies at, the, at that pavilion about springs, so some very informative movies. And the next day, <clears throat> we started our field part of the uh, field school. We launched at the 441 boat ramp with Lars Anderson as the guide. Uh, we demonstrated field sampling techniques, our, our staff did. Uh, we met at um, Gilchrist Blue Springs, one of the rangers, for a lunch and a talk. And we ultimately ended up down at the Highway 47 boat ramp that day. It was an incredible day. The next day, 
uh, everybody's getting kind of worn out, but we uh, took them out again, uh, started at it, it Stuckney Head Spring at 8 a.m. Uh, Sam Cole, the ranger, made a brief presentation. We launched and uh, paddled the whole upper at Stuckney River with Lars and, um, and then uh, had a, as we wrapped it all up shortly afternoon. And, um, and then we had a live Zoom question and answer session that night. So it was, it was a really interesting field school, different from any other one we've done. And what we taught the people, just briefly summarize it, is that there are different kinds of attributes uh, that can be used for understanding springs. There are physical attributes, there are chemical attributes, and there are biological attributes. And here's a list of some of the key ones in each of those categories. And uh, we've released the Florida Springs Conservation Plan that goes into great detail about these key ecological attributes and how scientists measure those. And so we have indicators of those attributes. We measure the discharge of spring. We measure the temperature consistency in springs. Um, we measure water clarity and the light transmission in springs. We, in terms of chemical measures, um, dissolved oxygen is one of the most important uh, aspects of spring chemistry. We measure the conductivity, or basically the number of the amount of dissolved salts in spring, because that's changing over time. And we measure nitrogen, which is the key pollutant that that's the highest uh, pollution levels in forest springs. And then biologically, we measure the photosynthetic efficiency through measurements of productivity. We measure the species diversity of the plants and diversity and biomass of the animals. So we introduced uh, the students in the class to those things. We gave some handy handouts. This is a handout on the plants that they would see in the springs. We have a handout on the fish in the springs. In fact, we have videos of all the common fish species in the springs that are on our website on the Florida Spring Institute.org website. And uh, so everybody had those. And then we put them on the river with Lars Anderson, who's probably the best known springs guide in the state of Florida. He's been doing this uh, for his whole career. Uh, we launched initially, like I said, at the 441. I'm sorry, we ate lunch here, not at Blue Springs. Uh, this is at Post Springs. Uh, this is a, a dive down into Gilchrist Blue Springs. You can see how clear the water is. Uh, this has become a state park just a few years ago. And uh, the water is just beautifully blue, hasn't reversed as far as we know. There's no tannins in the water. Uh, then we stopped at Poe Springs, and you can see the difference in the water clarity, the water color. Uh, this time, this spring is reversing uh, frequently each time there's a flood on the river. Uh, and that tannic water takes months or years to come out of the aquifer. Uh, and also, it's full of noxious algae. Um, it's um, and measuring its productivity and its wildlife. It's, as close to a dead spring as you can have. Unfortunately, that's the, the county spring that I used to take my kids to when they were little. Uh, of course, we went by Jenny Springs. We did not stop there, um, but we observed human use, and human use is one of the uh, one of the big impacts on springs as well. Uh, reduced flows, um, which allows springs to uh, increase nitrate. Uh, which pollute spring and then excessive human use are the three major impacts on our springs and uh, there are actually over about 1,090 springs now recorded by the Florida Geological Survey, uh, Artesian Springs in Florida, and uh, this is just a, a typical day at Jenny Springs. Uh, then the next day we started out at Itchtuckney, we immediately had a, a flip over here, unintentional, and of course Lars saved the day uh, with this gentleman. Um, and this is the, the rest of the group on the edge of uh, It was a beautiful day. Both days were beautiful to be out in the water. Uh, we, we saw lots of wildlife. The edge of is relatively clear. It's uh, partially polluted. Uh, it's got a decline in flows. It has high recreation, but it's a very robust spring because of its, um, just its ecology. It's got uh, high oxygen water and, and uh, it's in a state park. Uh, so uh, turtles, uh, Swanee Cooters and um, um, Spotted and long nose car. And then uh, the joy of joys is that we ended up right on a pot of manatees, which you can see here uh, with one of our uh, participants in the background. We got to spend quite a bit of time with these manatees. So, just in, in summary about the, the field school, uh, this was probably our most successful one in terms of the number of participants. We normally uh, don't, we can't um, accommodate. Um, 42 particip participants, but 
since 18 were lectures only, we can accommodate you know as many participants as want to sign up for that part of the field school. And I think we'll be doing that in the future where we have a combination of, of lectures that are online and actual site visits to springs uh, that are uh, on the water, which is fun. Uh, and we had um, and we had 23 people to sign up for the lectures and the field excursion. Uh, we gave out five scholarships and that was purely the result of the tag grant that we got. So thank you um, very much um, for that. And um, we got really high reviews in this field school too. In terms of a scale of one to five, all the review comments were up in the fours, uh, close to five. So I, th I think it was um, highly successful. We will have another field school this year, sometime later this year. Um, and that is also receiving some support from the uh, Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida. So thanks once again for that. And so there, there will be scholarships too. And it was interesting, the people that came on scholarships, I sort of expected them to be um, more students. and. Um, and um, it wasn't the case. We got people from all walks of life that uh, received the scholarships. So you can contact us. You can go to our, our uh, website, uh, floridaspringsinstitute.org, for really um, 12 years of information now about springs, their health, how to be, how to, they should be restored. Uh, and we do classes there. We uh, do monthly classes. We start those again soon, called the Springs Academy. We have other events as well. And um, we're all happy to see manatees returning or coming to the Hitchtucking River in large numbers. They're reliable now in the Hitchtucking River and the Silver Springs, where they have to really navigate some difficult uh, physical obstacles. And the Hitchtucking, uh, due to lower flows, the lower Hitchtucking is very shallow. And so it's difficult for the manatees to get over the natural limestone shelf and silver. Of course, the manatees have to navigate a dam and uh, and a uh, spillway uh, that they have to knock a lock system to get in there. But we have small populations in these two systems. And uh, there are springs that have probably the largest capacity for manatees in the state. So I think that's my presentation. I can stop sharing. Um, Julie was asking if Florida regulates the number of people who can visit individual springs daily. Bob, um, that might be that, a question for you. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, well, to some extent, um, some of the springs that are in state parks have capacity limits based on the size of the parking lot. And Lakai was one of those that Ben showed. I did studies there for several years for the state, and, and the only thing that limits the number of people is the parking lot. And so people actually line up in great lines outside the park to get in, and they have to wait until a parking space empties. Itchitutney actually has a carrying capacity. Uh, it used to be 750 tubers at the head spring, uh, and it's, it's been changed now where you can't even tube from the head spring. So that's a, uh, they allow people to go into tubing into the middle of the river, upper river at uh, Dampier's Landing. And so that, that limits uh, trampling of the plants in the upper part of the Estuckey River. Gilchrist Blue, the only limit there, once again, is a parking issue. And I don't know of any other springs that have limits, and certainly none of the private springs have limits yet. Uh, they just pack them in and unbelievable crowds uh, show up in springs on Memorial Day and 4th of July and during the summer weekends. Yeah. Um, ben, this could be a question. Um, I don't know if this quite touches on your work, but maybe you or, or Bob could have an answer to this. Julie was also asking if there's noticing any sex changes in fish caused by water runoff into the spring. She noted a study um, that was noticing those changes in Boulder. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I, I don't work with fish. I, I certainly have two wonderful colleagues in the biology department, uh, Dr. Missy Gibbs and Dr. Kirsten Work, who do a lot of work with fish, and I'm sure they could they could uh, address that question. I'm, I'm afraid that you're you're I'm a geologist by training. I'm afraid you're you're out of my wheelhouse there. <laughs> Understood. Um, yeah, Julie, if you wanted to shoot an email to me, I'm sure we could try to track down uh, try to track down an answer for you. Um, Bob, we have a question about wanting to know more about the controversy over your gorgeous mural. Is that something you want to talk uh, about? Uh, well, I don't know that much about it. I just keep hearing um, people referring to it. There's a group that wants to do mur murals throughout High Springs. And, um, and so they've been looking at brick walls from these old buildings to do murals on. 
sort of using ours as an example. And then there's another group of people who live in High Springs, the wanting murals in the town. So we look at the brick walls. So that's that's all I know right now. And, um, and nobody's told us we have to remove it. In fact, the city of High Springs actually helped fund it. And uh, I think it's a very popular part of High Springs overall. But there, there apparently are, are controversies concerning murals that I wasn't aware of. It's a gorgeous, a gorgeous uh, mural. Do we have, um, I just wanted to remind folks that you can use the raise your hand feature if you'd like to ask a question that way. Um, I'm not seeing any more in the chat unless I'm missing one. So go ahead if you have questions, don't be shy to raise your hand or share them in the chat. And while we're, we're waiting for them um, to come in, I wanted to see, uh, Ben or Bob, if you had any questions for each other, watching each other's presentations. Well, I certainly do for Ben. I, I didn't present any science really in mine, but he, he sure did and I really enjoyed it. Um, so, um, you know, the, the paradigm is that people weren't in Florida before 15,000 years ago and that the earliest dates are about 15,000 years. And, um, so I guess in your cores, when you got down to 18,000 years, there weren't any arrowheads in those cores, I assume. <laughs> no, it, no, that's a great question. It's kind of a funny, uh, I, you know, I started off in archaeology a long time ago. Uh, that, that's what got me in, really into some of the things I'm into now. Uh, that was at Florida State. I was actually in the underwater archaeology field school and dived some of those sites offshore in the Gulf of Mexico that I, that I showed. Um, so I, I worked actually quite for quite a few years in cultural resources management, you know, excavating sites and looking at artifacts. And I have to admit, I've never found an artifact in a core sample that I've taken and I, I would know what to look for. So, you know, I, I think you end up taking such a small sample, really, if you think about it, when you're when you're probing these sites, we, we do have to get it cleared with um you know, when we're we're taking samples in state parks, we have to get it cleared with archaeology uh, professionals usually. But um, no, I've I've never found uh, it. Certainly could be there. Um, you know, of course, a lot of well, our spring runs we do find artifacts that are even Paleo Indian age, so really old stuff. Yeah, the the Santa Fe is famous for the the Paleo artifacts, uh, as yeah. in Swanee, and and so we did a dig there. Few years ago, it was four four years of digging with uh, volunteers, and I've got a paper that's uh, I think it's been accepted now for Florida anthropologists about it. But we we uh, dated with OSL dating methods down uh, at the bottom of the cultural level, which was about six feet below the ground surface in this pure sand, and um, and we got dates over twenty five thousand years. Wow. So, it's uh, sort of shaking things up. The, re the reviewers are a little bit er worried about it, but I, I justified it uh, by, from my own time from, uh, it's right next to a, a spring, you know, it's right across from Lily Springs on the same sure. day. So people may have been there at the glacial maximum. That's, that would be of interest to what you're doing, uh, that uh, people weren't just living way out, you know, hundred miles further west, but we're living in the middle of the state. And that means the springs, at that time were uh, karst windows you know they weren't uh, they weren't flowing for the most part and it's really interesting you found that Wataiba had water in it uh, that long ago so that'd be useful for looking at the human history of springs yeah i i, I agree a hundred percent i i mean it seems like people uh, were using these as you know watering holes and if, if climate is drier and water tables are lower it makes sense that uh, th these would be kind of good Good places, uh, good good places to go. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think the the Wakaiwa results are certainly interesting. I, I forget his name. I think it was O'Donohue. There's an archaeologist that works for the state of Florida that actually mm -hmm. looked at uh, potential uh, head levels and and kind of how they they might have responded to water table changes and actually found a few springs that he thought uh, might have been flowing with with that drawdown and, and Wakaiwa was ended up being one of them, uh, which was kind of interesting. He did a big, like a lot of uh, GIS work or GIS geographic information systems and mapping software. And uh, it's kind of a cool finding. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. You know, Jim Dunbar, um, yeah. uh, the, the sediment uh, accumulation in some of these springs and sloth hole and, um, up there in the Alcilla River, 
uh, you know, the, that's where the earliest artifacts, dated artifacts right now have been found 15,000 years yeah. uh, by, by uh, the state. And uh, so, so it's real interesting, uh, but I'll send you a copy of my uh, manuscript. Yeah, great. Thank you. And the, the Paige Latson site there is um, on the Oscilla is just kind of one of the spectacular kind of best accepted, best known sites really in, in North America kind of for early archaeology. So certainly a wonderful, wonderful site. And, and Jim has been um, a, a wonderful person to talk to about a lot of this work. I actually was in a class with him at Florida State when I was an undergraduate. He was working on a graduate degree, so it was neat to reconnect with, with Jim. Uh, yeah, I was kind of curious about uh, actually, um, do, do you see a lot of college age students? And I was just wondering about sending some of our students to your uh, summer course. It's, it's funny, we we actually tried to organize a course with FSU once and there was a lot of paperwork involved. Yeah. We got almost to, to it and it never happened. Uh, we've got one of your students right now that's doing a special project with us, uh, just an individual project. and then. Um, and then we had a bunch of FSU students. It was a club, an outdoor club. We we have an event called Give Springs a Break, and it's a it's an outing on a, on Springs Break time of the year. Uh, it used to be at Jenny Springs, and uh, and we had a big group come from FSU a couple of years to that. So um, for the short course, it's usually too long and and too expensive for students, you know, because we have a lot of expenses and we we don't. We are not, we're not a for profit, but we got to at least break even on a class like that, and that's that's why these grants have been so helpful to us. We can do that, but we have we have, always have a mix, and there's always a few college students, if not more. Like I said, it, our Give Springs Break event is, is all college students. I actually had a, a question for both of you. Um, we're talking about ancient uses of Florida Springs and current uh, overuse of Florida Springs potentially. Like, what is other than folks who really care about the Springs buying the Protect Florida Springs plate to help fund future projects you may be doing, um, what is something that the, um, the folks listening right now could, could do that would help protect Florida Springs for the future? Um, well, I think they can become knowledgeable and uh, we will be having another field school this year. Um, they should um, read what's out there and, and I'm so happy that Jason Evans got the Aquatic Center started. That's a, that's a really important move. Uh, we'd like to have a statewide Springs Institute as well at Silver Springs, but uh, the funding just hasn't been available for that. Ultimately, we may have that. Um, but it's, it's really, if we have a knowledgeable public about the problems with Springs, and they share that information with others. I think that there's more that the state can do, literally. There's, um, there's various uh, water quality regulations that have been poorly implemented and poorly enforced over the years. And uh, the water quantity issue is the main one of the springs. The spring, uh, Ben had that picture of uh, white springs, a spring without any flow is, a, is literally a dead spring. And, and that's possible as the geologic record indicates, that's possible in any spring. If you uh, pump the aquifer down far enough, uh, we're gonna dry up more springs. Um, that's about all I can say without getting real political. I'm not going to do that. I, I would add to that. At, you know, education is is really important. Um, you know, and and obviously uh, because of the heavy use of of many of our springs in Florida, people love the springs, right? So, uh, but we don't want to love the springs to death. So um, it, it's really important that people learn about the impacts, and a lot of times that takes financial support and, and funding. Um, you know, we, we understand a lot of the science. We need to keep doing the science because we have to understand how the systems continue to evolve and change. But uh, I, I agree with, with Bob 100% that education is really key. And uh, that, that certainly does uh, take uh, some financial support to, to be able to get people together to, to make that happen. And uh, I, I, can, I can thank you for one more thing, Michelle. And that is, uh, I think, the, yeah. the science we put up about how to how to play in the spring and not trample the spring. Uh, that was based on a grant from your your organization as well. Yeah. And, and there's a actually there's a whole movie that was made by a cinematographer about how to play mm -hmm. in the spring. So 
there's links to all those things on our website. And, uh, um, and I just hope people will, like Ben said, be careful when they go to Springs and realize that every one of us has a footprint and uh, just minimize our own footprints and then work to, to take care of the really big footprints which are out there. And I wanted to give just on the yeah. note of awareness, there was an excellent um, Springs article by Jason Gulley. I believe he's with us today um, on the Zoom. Uh, that appeared in the New York Times. He's um, a photojournalist and um, has, I think he did his uh, PhD at, um, hey Jason, uh, at UF. And so if anybody wants to read about Florida Springs, um, it came out, I believe, was it Monday or Sunday, Jason, in the, in the New York Times, but um, it's on our social media platforms. If you missed it, check out our social media. We've linked to it and um, just an excellent article. So there's folks out there like Jason um, and raising awareness in the media about Florida Springs. I don't know if you wanted to say anything, Jason. I don't want to put you on the spot. I yeah, know it's super great to meet everybody and hear about what people have been doing. I um, started working in photojournalism about two years ago as an outgrowth of research that I was doing on springs and, and kind of climate change issues as an academic. A lot of my research wasn't really going to any place other than other academics. Um, so having got tenure about two years ago at the same time that the pandemic happened and it shut down field work, it was a really neat opportunity to start experimenting with uh, directly educating the public through kind of national and international media. Well, I want to thank you for that article, Jason. That was amazing. And it was, um, it was, it was really nice to meet you uh, through video here. So thank you, Michelle, for making that happen. I, I could add uh, one more thing uh, kind of about education and the uh, Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida and, and uh, you, you, Michelle has been really good uh, about kind of beating the drum out there and, and uh, you know alerting uh, media so they kind of know about some of what's going on I've been contacted by a number of different outlets and have been able to do an interview on TV and that kind of thing so there, there's a lot of support for education that's going on behind the scenes like that. And if anybody wants to watch um, Ben's interview, it's under it's on our website, wildlifeflorida.org, and under the media link. And you can find links to, um, uh, if you scroll down, it's WPTV. Uh, ben talked to them a few months ago. It was an excellent interview. And if you're just curious about any of the other projects we funded um, via the Protect Florida Springs plate, those are also on our website. Um, very easy to find in the top menu bar. I want to thank um, Bob and Ben and Jason, <laughs> everyone for joining and all of you for taking an hour out of the middle of a busy week to talk to us about Florida Springs. I wanted to give, um, you know, we have a couple minutes left. I wanted to give Bob and Ben any last thoughts you wanted to leave the group with. Um, ben. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, um, I. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, get out there and and uh, get out on the on the springs, I guess, and, and enjoy them in a responsible way. And and uh, you know that they're, they're uh, w wonderful places to be. Uh, I know we're always out on the springs and enjoy them for for a lot of different reasons. But but uh, they're certainly a treasure we want to protect. I've been in uh, many states around the the U.S. and and certainly that's one of the really big things that that makes Florida unique. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I just want to urge everybody to buy their Springs license tag. Uh, that's where this uh, money comes from that uh, has funded the work we talked about today. I think it's really important to have that and to have that um, uh, coming from an agency that is um, willing to share this information with everybody. So thank you very much, Michelle, for what you're doing. Yes, well, thank, thank you. you. No, thank you. And um, I need to share credit, not with just me, but we have a whole team of people. I think Anita's on this call, who's our grants administrator, who handles all those um, grant requests. So if you have a question about how to, if you're an organization or someone doing research and you want to know more about how to get a, a grant through us, Anita's the person to contact. You can send me an email and I'll put you in touch with Anita. And there's a lot of us um, out here, but we're really thankful for the work that you're doing. We look forward to supporting future projects. Um, Again, the link is in uh, in the chat at the very top. If you want to give us feedback, thank you for everyone who's been sending very kind messages. Everyone, you guys are getting 10 out of 10, five stars. Everybody's saying it was a great presentation, uh, super informative. 
Um, and I think the last thing I'd like to say is, you know, look for an email uh, from us next month. We're going to do next month. We're going to talk about pythons in a grant we gave out about um, finding, tracking down pythons and getting them out of the Everglades. So if that's something interesting to you, uh, keep an eye on your email for next month's conversation. So thank you everyone again. Look forward to talking more soon.